Thank you very much. I'd like to begin with a question. Everyone in the audience tonight, how many of you have been into a London coffee shop in the last two weeks? Put your hand up if you have. Well, that's uh, a lot of people. That's definitely over half. And for all those people that just put their hands up, can you imagine walking into that coffee house you visited, sitting down next to a stranger and asking for the latest news? Can you imagine whipping a book of poetry out of your jacket, slamming it down next to someone else's coffee, demanding to know their opinion before delivering your own critical précis to the whole shop in a big, booming voice? <laughs> I suspect not. Uh, you'd be taken for a menace, perhaps even a freak. 300 years ago, such behaviour was encouraged and applauded in thousands of coffee houses all over the city. Back in the day, going for a coffee wasn't uh, an inconsequential part of the working day. It was a voyage of discovery that could change your life. 18th century coffee houses were candlelit forums for intellectual exchange, spirited debate, and commercial transaction, and they were powered by news and gossip. They would transform the face of the city forever, connect Londoners, and inspire ideas that continue to shape the world we live in today. And uh, the origins of coffee, which also happens to be the origins of the modern enlightened world, can be traced to this churchyard here. This is St. Michael's. Um, today it's a sanctuary of calm, away from the roaring traffic of Cornhill. But in the mid-17th century, this was part of a heaving, cacophonous marketplace. And uh, amidst the whirl of commerce, you would have seen, through a haze of steam, right where those black railings now stand, you would have seen a tall man, a tall swarthy man in a brightly colored turban with a twirly mustache. His eyes would be darting back and forwards like baby tadpoles. He'd be holding a tin kettle, and he'd be pouring a foul-looking liquor into little porcelain dishes, something oily, pungent, bitter, and black. So this is uh, Mr. Pasqua Rosé. He's the first man to sell coffee in London. He was an eccentric Greek by trade. He spent most of his working life living in Smyrna, Turkey, where he worked as a valet, a manservant, to a British overseas merchant called Daniel Edwards. And whilst out there, Mr. Edwards developed a penchant for this disgustingly bitter yet curiously energizing liquor, ubiquitous in Turkey, but something of a rarity in England at the time, cave, coffee. So when business recalled Mr. Edwards from his sun-kissed Turkish paradise back to the cold, dark, drizzly city of London, he couldn't envisage life without his trusted valet, nor the bitter black drink that he brewed to such perfection. And the solution was simple, bring both back with him, which is precisely what he did. So he sent Pasqua off originally into the drawing room of his house in Woolbrook, where he'd prepare this drink, three times a day for all the local merchants of Cornhill and Cheapside. And the sight of all these men crammed into the room, slurping the drink, sealing deals and forging connections over the bitter Mohammedan gruel as it came to be known, fostered an epiphany within the mind of Mr. Edwards. What if we brought coffee to the wider public and sold it on the streets of London? So Pasqua opened London's first coffee house, or rather coffee shack, because um, although there's no surviving artist's impression, this one is uh, an early 19th century picture of a Thames frost fair, um, topical for today. And you can see in the middle a coffee tent, and you can see the steam rising um, from um, the coffee cauldron, if you like. Pasqua's shack would have looked a little bit like that, with one crucial difference. It was decorated in the most garish of Islamic colours. Um, Pasqua was acutely aware that uh, Londoners were kind of miserable and oppressed in the 1650s because they were suffering the full force of Puritan oppression. So by having this uh, oriental shack, it was like a flash of color in a gray and mournful world. But Pasqua, for, um, for his part, he was aware that coffee hailed from Turkey, which was the evil empire of its day. So he needed to embark upon this mission to detoxify the brand. And he did that by publishing this handbill in 1652 entitled The Virtue of the Coffee Drink. And his strategy was simple. He thought, let's just pretend coffee is a wonder drug that can cure any ailment under the sun. 
So it's hailed as the perfect antidote to dropsy, scurvy, gout, depression, the melancholic winds, earthquakes at one point, so you don't see it here. And um, he goes on to say that it will relieve women of the agonies of childbirth. As is quite right, he says coffee is to be drunk as hot as can possibly be endured, and uh, it will make one fit for business. Now, coffee became a smash hit. This propaganda campaign worked, and before long, his shack was overflowing with activity. People from all over the city swarmed underneath this um, oriental canopy to meet, greet, drink, think, write, pipe, gossip, debate, gyrate, and jest, all fired up by this gruel that uh, made you think you were going to live forever. And uh, let's, let's be straight about this. It wasn't the taste of the coffee that people liked. Okay, for those of us who are accustomed to a silky smooth flat white brewed to Epicurean precision in one of London's amazing third wave coffee houses like Taylor Street Baristas or Monmouth Coffee, the taste of the 17th century stuff would have sent you heading for the nearest toilet bowl. Um, it's not just us that think that, you can try it if you come on a tour, you can, as it would have tasted, but back in the day, people found it disgusting as well. It was routinely compared to oil, soot, ink, damp, and uh, most commonly, I'm afraid, just shit. Um, one early sampler said it reminded him of the uh, syrup of soot and the essence of old shoes. But it was the effects of coffee that people loved, this mental and physical boost. And remember, at the time, there was very little tradition of sobriety. You couldn't really drink river water because it was lethal. Most people drank watered-down beer all the time. So the arrival of coffee... Uh, triggered a dawn of sobriety that laid the foundations for spectacular economic growth in the years and decades that followed. So it was coffee, not tea, that built the British Empire. None of which pleased the uh, owners of the Georgian Vulture Tavern, nor any of the other six alehouse and taverns nearby. Um, they leered across at this uh, heathenish invader, dispensing his diabolical concoctions, and they began to plot the downfall of Pasqua Rosé. But by this time, Pasqua had become infected with the lifeblood of the city of London. A sense of aspiration surged through his veins. He began to see himself or think of himself as a kind of Greek Dick Whittington, a man who was going to soar up from such humble origins and achieve unimaginable wealth and fame by building an emporium of coffee houses, which was going to hold the whole of London um, in its grip. In the event, to our great cost, he was pipped to the post by this man. Howard Schultz, the chief executive officer of um, Starbucks, and they own uh, 752 stores all over the country. And uh, in the last three years, they reported a colossal 1.2 billion pounds of coffee sales. And a uh, kind guy that he is, he pledged to pay precisely 0% of that in corporation tax. Um, which I think is kind of unfair. But back to the 17th century, <laughs> Pasqua was ultimately destroyed by this unholy alliance of alehouse tavern keepers. The Lord Mayor got involved in the church too. And in 1658, he atrophies into the oblivion of history. No one knows what happened to Pasqua Rosé. But although the man disappeared, the dream lived on. He triggered a coffeehouse boom of near biblical proportion. By 1663, there were 82 coffee houses in the city of London. By the dawn of the 18th century, there were 3,000 coffee houses. My personal favorite is, um, this is something I forgot to mention, women hated coffee. Uh, women weren't allowed to go into coffee houses. Um, and they resented the fact that their men folk were spending their time chatting and reading the papers and having a nice time whilst they were, um, you know, having a bit of a hard grind. So years of simmering resentment erupted into the crescendo of fury that was this pamphlet in 1674. And they lambasted coffee. Um, they objected to it as a substance that was corrosive to the very essence of masculinity. It was going to transform their virile, industrious men into effeminate, babbling French layabouts. And uh, this was not something they were prepared to countenance, but England being a misogynistic society, they were roundly ignored, and that was that. So, by the dawn of the 18th century, we have Button's Coffee House. Now, this was opened in 1712 by Joseph Addison in the middle as a refuge from his unhappy marriage, so another advantage from his perspective of the misogynistic door policy. But this soon grew into a forum for literary debate. Every single wit in the whole of town would assemble here each night 
casting their superb literary judgments on the works of aspiring authors, making and breaking literary reputations in the process. So let's just go on a little whirlwind tour of buttons. You're climbing up the stairs, the doors creak open, you're engulfed in a whirlwind of smoke, sweat, and steam. As the steam clears, you're confronted with a scene that looks something like this. And you'll see rows of men in periwigs sitting around long wooden tables. And before you can really get a good look at them, you're assailed with cries of, what news have you? Or more formally, your servant, sir, what news from Tripoli? Or if you went to the Latin coffee house where you had to speak Latin, quid novi. You'd walk over, you'd see they're not kind of, they're not upmarket and ornate like the coffee houses of Vienna or the grand cafes of Paris. They're sturdy and wooden and workmanlike, shaved wooden floors, that kind of thing. You'd walk over to the bench, you'd have to divulge your said nugget of news or gossip, something you'd heard or read earlier. More often than not, something you'd made up on the spot, for they were wellsprings of misinformation and rumor. And uh, lie or whatever it was um, divulged, the men would shuffle up and you'd get a whiff of their civet perfume as you sat down. You'd click your fingers, and a little Cupid-like boy with a flowing periwig and a nice silk cravat would come over and give you a candle, a pipe, and your drink. Probably coffee, perhaps chocolate, if you were slightly richer, or tea, if you were aristocratic. Um, and there was one drink that sadly doesn't survive into our world anymore, um, but was a big hit in coffee houses like this. Um, it was the sickly-sounding chocolate wine. Um, so that was uh, something if you wanted to mix uh, the bean and the grape. And uh, once you sat down, you would melt into a conversation. No such thing as a private conversation in a coffee house. Everything is public. And watching it all through a haze of smoke and steam was that. This is a cross between a lion and a wizard. And uh, the public were invited to feed it with letters and limericks and poems, the very best of which would be roared out in a special edition of the original Guardian newspaper, which was edited in side buttons by the wit Joseph Addison. This was a single sheet paper, only cost three half pennies. The lion, he was a playful British variation on a chilling Venetian tradition. Any of you have been to the Doge's Palace in Venice, you may have seen similar lions clustered around the gates to the palace. But whereas uh, in Venice, the lion tormented the public by swallowing accusations of treason that got people locked up and beheaded and that kind of thing. Mr. Addison's lion was, in contrast, as harmless as a pussycat and a servant of the public. The Latin quotation at the bottom linking him to Domitian's lion, which uh, was uh, so tame, apparently, that it would let hares play in front of its snout, if lions have snouts, nose is probably better, without ripping it to shreds. So that was Buttons, a forum for literary debate. Do you want to see what's become of it today? It's a Starbucks. <laughs> and uh, the lion has been replaced by the Starbucks community notice board. Uh, he's currently imprisoned in a vault in Woburn Abbey. And uh, people are just sitting on their own. And this is really sad. Let's go back to this image. Everything about this, I think you will agree, oozes warmth and welcome from the bubbling coffee cauldron right down to the kind eyes and the flickering candles on the tables themselves. This warms the spirits, this chills the soul. <laughs> In places, you were warned, I wasn't a fan of Starbucks. Places like this, customers sit on their own, sequestered from the world, cocooned in their own thoughts, immersed in online social networks, either that or just staring blankly out of the window. But the original coffee houses, they thrived on the spark of human contact. And uh, it's such a shame that most conversations going on in places like this today are virtual. We have the Grecian, which was wonderful, but we don't have time for it. We're going to move on, because some of you may have noticed that 300 years after Pasqua opened his shack, we're living through another coffee house revolution in London. And we've seen the appearance of these, uh, a fleet of small, independent, third-wave coffee houses. This is Proofrock Cafe in Leather Lane. This one here is Milk Bar. It's very hip. Coffee's always been cool in the way that tea tends to be kind of quaint. Um, this is um, Towpath, dug into Regent's Canal, where you sip your coffee and you watch swans and barges and various other things float past. They all pride themselves on the Epicurean quality of their coffee. They obsess over sourcing the best locally roasted coffee. And uh, I'm sure you all know it is absolutely delicious. I mean, just look at that. You just want to wolf it down in one. Um, but the, the slight problem with them is that uh, if you go in, you see people talking to their friends, 
But you don't really see strangers interacting in the same way as you did in the original coffee houses. People are often staring into not the sparkling eyes of a man asking after the latest news, but the electronic glare of a laptop or a smartphone. So what we need to do, if possible, is um, make this a revolution in the true sense, that is, a turn of the wheel back to the halcyon days of the Georgian coffee house. We've come a long way. You know, the coffee no longer tastes like a syrup of soot mixed with old shoes, but we need to get this conviviality back. So I'd like to ask you the next time you go into a coffee house, um, and I hope it's not a Starbucks, it's going to be one of these small independent coffee shops, don't sit on your own, don't sit with your laptop, go and sit down at a table next to a stranger, put your hand on their shoulder, stare into their eyes, and say, what news have you?